Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to The Nest. It's July 9th, 2020, and we're streaming live with participants from North America, Europe, and Africa. For those of you joining for the first time, I'm Jim Chu in San Francisco, California, and the goal here on The Nest is to connect entrepreneurs in frontier markets with angel investors from around the world. We stream live every Thursday, and all episodes are recorded and available on our website, findthenest.org. Today, I'm very pleased to announce that, we're, that we have a guest moderator, Jorian Wilkins from the Opportunity Collaboration. She'll be running the show today, not me, thank God. Uh, we'll also welcome two new angels to the show, Arno Ventura and hopefully Tommy Davies, but um, he hasn't shown up yet, so I might just jump in for him. We also have one returning angel, Vishal Ardawal. Welcome back, Vishal. We'll be hearing from two companies, one from West Africa and another from East Africa. We'll hear all about them in a second, but before that, I have a few important announcements. So next week on July 16th, we will host a session with uh, the Bangladesh Angels at a special time, 7 a.m. San Francisco, 3 p.m. London, and 8 p.m. Dhaka time to highlight some great opportunities in Bangladesh. And then the week after that, we will have an all-female entrepreneur uh, nest. Uh, focused mostly on Southern Africa. And then the week after that, on July uh, 30th, we will have a nest with 1,000 alternatives coming back to Africa, uh, focusing on Rwanda and Kenya. So I hope you um, can join us for all of those future nests. And with that, I'm pleased to hand it over to Jorian. Over to you, Jorian. Thank you, Jim. As you know, I'm a huge fan and I'm excited to be part of today's episode of The Nest. In a non-pandemic year, I typically convene over 400 impact investors and entrepreneurs, along with grant makers and nonprofits building sustainable solutions to poverty around the globe, four days a year at Opportunity Collaboration, which delegates know as OC. After a decade, OC's network now connects over 2,500 social sector leaders from over 85 countries. And I know how important and how difficult it can be to connect across continents. And that's why I was thrilled to see Jim launch The Nest a few months ago. Not only because I'm a fan of the primetime Shark Tank, but because I really understand the value in creating more access for emerging market entrepreneurs to angels around the globe and vice versa. And I've seen some really thoughtful matchmaking going into these episodes, so I'm glad to be part of today's Nest. Thank you, Jim. Um, I'm going to ask each of today's angels to introduce themselves in a minute, but before we get started, I wanted to be sure I emphasize to everyone joining that the Nest is an interactive forum and questions and comments are welcome from everyone. You are specifically invited to use Zoom's chat feature to comment and ask questions throughout the episode and you'll be invited to respond to a few polls as well. Um, right now, you can go ahead and find the chat button and please introduce yourself to the group. And while you're doing that in chat, we're gonna turn now to um, hearing briefly from our angels live. Um, Arnaud um, is only able to join us for the very first part of today's session, but was eager to hear from some of our entrepreneurs today. So Arnaud, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself first? Thank you, uh, Jory, and thank you, Jim, for inviting me. Very sorry to be here just uh, for a few minutes, unfortunately. Uh, I made a big mistake with the time difference being in Paris today. Uh, quick introduction, I've been uh, involved in the last 20 years in emerging market financial sector. I've built uh, two business uh, in the sector. The first one was called Planet Finance. We were doing mainly advisory services and technical assistance to microfinance institutions uh, worldwide. And I established about 30 offices in uh, 30 countries in emerging markets uh, between two, 2000 and 2007. And then I, I led Baobab Microcred, a company I, I started in a 2005, 2007. We started investing in 2007 in uh, mostly Africa and China um, and developed a group of microfinance bank. Last year, Microcred lent 1 billion euro to 1 million entrepreneurs in 10 countries in Africa and China. And that resulted to be very, uh, that generated about $200 million of revenue, $40 million of profits uh, before tax. And so I left at the end of the year to get involved in a few of our business. And I'm uh, <clears throat> actively engaged in a couple of boards 
and uh, advisor of a few uh, exciting uh, tech and fintech company. I'm also uh, investing a bit in the same type of companies and I'm uh, also working on my next venture, planning to uh, launch something in the coming, uh, in the coming months. Thank you. Thank you, Arno. Great. Appreciate that. Uh, we also have joining us today, Michelle Agarwal, who's here for the third time, much more of a veteran than myself. Michelle, do you want to say hello? Hello, everybody. I'm delighted to be back. Always a pleasure to be on, on, uh, on the nest. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm a former partner of PwC. I used to run the Africa-wide deals team um, and, and then subsequently uh, senior leader at General Electric. I exited my corporate career three odd years ago. If you haven't read my book, you must. It's called Give to Get. Um, but more importantly, uh, I sort of run a diversified portfolio. I invest um, in startups. I have a venture portfolio now, roughly 35, 36 companies thereabouts. Uh, I have some commercial real estate and a late career interest in hospitality. I'm also the non-executive chairman of a new fund called Launch Africa that Jim's uh, LP in. I see some other people on this on the participant list that are involved in Launch Africa, but uh, it's a seed seed to a round fund, um, uh, much needed in this part of the world. I'm delighted to be here again today. Great, and, thank you so much. And just to jump in, Jory, and I think uh, Tommy is not going to make it, so I'm happy to jump in as a potential angel for this round. Um, so I'll just do a quick intro of myself. Um, I'm based in San Francisco and um, I invest in startups both in developed markets and developing markets. Uh, and I do that on a personal level, but also through Untapped, uh, my company. And with Untapped, we're really focused on driving more investment in asset financing to support entrepreneurs in frontier markets. So um, that's it. Great. Thank you so much, Jim and Vishal and Arno. Thank you for being here today. Um, let's see now if we have uh, any results from our poll about who's here. We could throw those up. Um, wow. Here, we're going to go ahead and put the poll up so you guys can let us know where you're from, and then we'll show the results in a little bit here um, so that our audience can let us know. We have people joining us from all over the globe, typically at the Nest, both um, investors and entrepreneurs. Right. All right. And, um, but, but I have a question before you start, Jorian. So Okay. Can we have the, the nest at wherever your background is the next time? Because I think we need to have a nest there. <laughs> I appreciate that question. Um, my background is the home of hopefully the next opportunity collaboration when convening becomes safe again, we hope to return to the Dominican Republic uh, in the Miches at Club Med's new socially and environmentally responsible uh, resort. We got to go to their grand opening in January and it will be a great place right. to bring together people building mm -hmm. solutions I, to I poverty. I think that's an excellent goal for the nest. All right. Yeah. So nice so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Great goal for us all. Um, okay, I'm about to introduce you to um, the first uh, entrepreneur, but first let me go over some of the rules of the nest. Um, each enterprise will have five minutes to present. That's just five minutes. And then there'll be 15 to 20 minutes for questions and hopefully a deal discussion. Um, I will have to cut you off at five minutes, so please help us respect the time so we can have a good discussion to follow. Um, and okay, with that, I'd like to get right to it. Simon Schwal is here from OCO to tell us about index and crop insurance from farmer, for farmers in West Africa. Simon, take it away. Thank you, Joanne. So let me ask you a question first. How would you feel if I told you that if it doesn't rain by the end of this week, you will lose all your income for the next six months. You would feel helpless, right? Well, that is the everyday situation for two billion people around the world who live from unirrigated farming. And this is what happened to Sunny, a friend who grows rice in rural Mali and who lost all his income after insufficient rain last year. OCO brings an insurance solution to all these unbanked smallholder farmers. We're talking here about 500 million small and medium businesses. So it's not only a big social issue, it's a huge business opportunity. It's $20 billion in premium that are just waiting to be unlocked. The reason why this ex opportunity exists is that traditional crop insurance was never designed for smallholder farmers. 
sending someone on site to verify the extent of the damages is not scalable. And also, how do, how do we bring insurance to someone like Kane who lives far from any city, has no bank account, and never heard about insurance before? So OCO is different. OCO is a fully automated insurance product available from any device and very affordable. All you need to do is dial a few numbers on your phone to open the OCO menu where you can find more information, register, pay for your insurance or make a claim. So how does it work? It's very simple. First, farmers use this code to enter our menu and obtain a quote based on their location, crop type and field size. Next, they pay using mobile money and receive a confirmation that they are insured. And then we monitor the weather at the location of the field. If you observed that they have been suffering from adverse weather, like excessive rain or insufficient rain, they automatically receive a compensation on their mobile wallet. Other companies have been doing this before and Arno will recognize Planet Guarantee here. Um, but the way we differentiate is that we are the most universally accessible solution out there. You don't need to be part of a specific microfinance organization or a specific cooperative that is partnering with these companies. You just need to have a mobile phone. We are positioned as a broker, meaning that we take a commission out of the revenue we generate for the insurance companies. We do the product design, distribution, and claim verification while they carry the risk. We already have signed partnerships with major players in Africa, Allianz, Orange, and AB InBev, which means that we can enter many markets in Africa with at least one partner. And we started in Mali, where we incorporated in 2018, we ran some pilots last year, and now since January, we are fully available as a commercial product. And what we achieved there is quite remarkable. Since we launched uh, in January, we recruited and trained agents to go and interact with farmers. And in only three months, we received 30,000 calls for information. 5,000 farmers registered and more than 1,800 have paid for their insurance. They all use their phone, access insurance for the first time in their life. And behind these figures, you can see some of the people who already received the compensation. And not only are they insured, they are also able to access micro loans uh, in more favorable terms, thanks to partnerships we signed with Baobab. At this stage, we are, have this exciting traction, but we haven't validated enough KPIs to attract uh, large VCs to close a big round. So today, our ask is to get some help from business angels um, to reach a larger scale, to reach 20,000 paying customers, which we should be able to achieve like by the next, in the next 12 months, at which time we will be able to close the route. And when I say help, we need funding, but also uh, help and having someone like Arno or Jim as part of our advisory board will, will make a big change when we talk to VCs. Our team combines relevant expertise and a shared passion for development. Shazad, our CTO, worked for three years in Uganda for the One Acre Fund, where he developed mobile solutions to bring finance to farmers. And Mariam comes from the, mo the most prominent um, incubator in Bamako. As for me, I spent the last five years of my life working in microinsurance, bringing affordable life and health insurance products to almost half a million people in countries such as Papua New Guinea, Fiji, Senegal, or Egypt, where insurance was not affordable before. To sum up, OCO unlocks a huge opportunity for insurance and reinsurance companies, solves the problem felt by billions of people around the world, and leverage the existing mobile money solution to bring an effective and a profitable product. So today, we would like to give you the opportunity to join us, and because we know that with the right partners, we can create the most impactful insurance product ever created. Thank you. Great, Simon. Thank you so much for a very on-time presentation. Much appreciated. Um, I wanted to let all the audience know that we are reading the chat here. So if you have questions, please go ahead and use the chat, chat feature to ask your questions and we'll try to pull some audience questions in here as well. Um, but first I'd like to go ahead and turn to the angels and particularly our Noah, we still have you with us to ask if you have any questions for Simon. Yes, I was about to type one, which is, I have many questions for Simon, and Simon will probably need to get this uh, on the side together. But one uh, general question to start, why did you start with Mali? 
so Mali is an interesting market because Orange has a very strong presence there and has uh, quite successful uh, implementation of their Orange money system. It's also a market where more than 70% of the working population works in agriculture. So we know that there's a lot of people who can use our service. Uh, but it was also an opportunity we had because um, a friend from university was uh, heading at the head of Orange Money at the time when I launched Coco. So she knew what we were doing and knew she was there. And we, she really wanted us to bring a relevant um, insurance solution to Orange Money. So this made uh, the case for, for Mali. Today, we are also operating in Uganda uh, with uh, AB InBev. So we are starting to, uh, to expand already internationally. Great. Um, I'm not sure who still has uh, control over the presentation, but there's an ask from the audience to please put the ask slide back up. If you want to throw that back up, that might help as we continue with the discussion. Um, other angels, other questions for Simon? I'd like to understand more about the unit economics. Um, so how much uh, is one customer worth to you and how much are you paying, if you will, to, to acquire one? Sure. So um, these 1,800 paying customers, in average, they paid around $9 in premium, of which we keep about 30% as a, as a commission. 30%, and to, okay. Great. To acquire these customers, we actually spent around $9 per paying customer as well. So on the first year, we're actually not making any profit, obviously, but the idea is that over the time, over a few following seasons, we will make up for this difference because then we have these customers in our database, we can just call them to re-register them. Also, we expect the premium to increase. Today, we are only insuring corn, but we are going to, to cover more valuable crops such as cotton, coffee, cocoa, and the, the premium will increase. And in a country like Uganda, there are two seasons per year, so this uh, $9, if it stays the same, it would be already multiplied by two uh, in terms of lifetime value or year time value. So it looks like I'd like to, uh, if you don't mind, I'd love to understand how your, your underwriting process works and your claims processing piece works. And then the relationship between the underwriter and you, how does that whole thing work? Yeah, would you just talk to that a little bit? Sure. So, um, showing us you this slide. So this is a tool that we use in our back end to calculate the price of insurance. So you can see, you can choose the risk that you want to insure, set the triggers in terms of cumulative rainfall in that case, and the period. And this shows you the risk of this event to happen based on 25 years of historical weather data. So this is how we define the product. We define the triggers for the payment. And then we bring this to uh, the insurance company that we're partnering with, in, in our case, it's Allianz. Uh, who runs through these calculations and verifies that this is something that they are able to cover. Once they give the green light, then uh, we distribute this product. And the claim validation, as I explained, is based on the same data, the same uh, weather data that we collect from satellite providers. And as soon as we see that the threshold has been reached, a payment is made to, uh, to the partners. And, and the, the claims process between you and them is seamless. It's all digital because you're yes. dispersing right away, right? I mean, you don't even need the farmer to fill out any kind of form or application. The moment there's an event, you disperse, right? That's, yeah, that's the beauty of it. Uh, there's no need for farmers to make a claim. We already know what is the situation. So we just inform them of how much they are eligible for. So it's, we don't pay straight away because we wait the end of the season to make sure what is the compensation that they need to receive. After that, it takes about two days to gather the, the relevant data, but then uh, payment is made. So almost, um, almost with no delay, farmers receive the compensation that they need to prepare the next season or to overcome the financial difficulties that they face. Okay, can I just take a minute to, to understand from your changing tracks, um, your, your scaling and expansion plans. The heart of my interest, if any in you, will come from can you go beyond, are you a Mali company? Are you an Africa play, right? So can you take a few minutes to speak to that? Show me the use of the money and show me the Africa dream, if at all. Okay, so um, we are a, 
We are actually based, uh, headquartered in Israel, uh, but our first market of operation is Mali, and now we have a second country of operation, which is Uganda. So we aim to be uh, first a Pan-African company, but then, then we can also aim beyond that to Latin America, Southeast Asia, where we know this service is also needed. Um, so the, the so I'm sorry, just for the clarification, do you already have partnerships with all three of these organizations? Yes, signed okay. partnership with Alliance is the three-year deal. With Orange, it's only locally in Mali, but with AB InBev, it's also a global partnership. Um, and the, the, the use of the money, to answer Vishal's question, uh, at the moment, what we need to do is to prove the model in, a, in our first market, which is Mali, bring it to somewhere close to profitability, to show that we know how to do this and that we cracked the distribution model um, before raising more funds and uh, expanding internationally. So uh, uh, right now our goal is to develop more products, improve our distribution channel, to reduce the cost of acquisition and have more sales per agent so that we ha reach the unit economics that make a uh, little bit more sense. And then we can scale up in, uh, in all these markets where we can quickly replicate, for example, with Valiant and Orange, we can go to Ivory Coast and Madagascar in no time. And uh, AB InBev already wants us to launch in Zambia and Tanzania as well. So, so what is break-even scale for you guys in, in a single country? Is it 10,000 uh, insured? Is it 100,000? Is it a million insured? What, what's the right number? Uh, according to our calculation, it's between 20 and 30,000 people insured. Um, that's so not very much. I mean, you're, you're already 10% there after a few months. Yeah, uh, exactly. And that's why we've only one product. We've only corn and uh, during the pandemic crisis. So that's why we believe we only need another season uh, to, to reach that goal. Uh, we cannot, uh, at the moment, the season is ongoing and we cannot register more, more members, but as soon as it finishes around October, we will launch our registration period for the next season. So by the end of um, April, I think we'll be uh, at that stage of 20, 30,000 paying customers. And, and this customer acquisition, I can see Raj asking, how do you get to 30,000 customers and how much are you going to spend? Is, is it fair to say you're acquiring these customers on the back of Orange on their network? Is this, so that's, yeah. that's these, are, these are the Orange countries, literally and figuratively. This is all France Telecom map on your, on your map, right? Is that, yes. is that how you're, is that how you're so, traveling across Africa? Is that the answer? So yeah, our first partner is Orange in terms of distribution. Um, and that's why we want to, that's why we are so widely available. And that's a great way to scale up because we can replicate the same system with their Orange Money uh, services in other markets. Now, uh, they don't give us straightly, straight away access to their customers, but for example, they gave us a very valuable um, uh, real estate place uh, by being in the the first line on the orange money menu for about four months. Uh, so everyone who was using the menu was, was seeing new on orange money, crop insurance with Voco, dial this code to, to find out more. And with this only, we had something like 600 requests for information every day. So having this partnership with orange is very valuable to us. Um, and we leverage this as much as we can. Okay. And so what, so this is just to clarify, this is just a smartphone um, app or is this also a feature phone app? This is a feature phone app, right? Because it's, most uh, farmers are feature phones. Phone. Um, the video I have here is only on the smartphone, but it's using the USSD technology, which gotcha. is available okay. on the uh, device. Yeah, so, uh, that's obviously, it's, an, it's imperative for this to work with farmers. Okay. No, no, no data needed, no smartphone, no, uh, no credit even. You can even enter our, our menu with a credit. So I'm going to look at this very much from a financial investment perspective, but um, what's your exit? What, what, do you, what do you see as a potential longer term exit if I'm a financial investor? So, and, 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 and let me ask that question from two levels. What are you looking for personally? And yeah. second, what do you think is potential for the company? So to be very short and to make a shortcut, we want to be the lemonade of crop insurance. Basically, we want to uh, make it easy to access, make it affordable to everyone. And um, the biggest market there are today are in emerging markets. So that's where we are focusing. So that's our goal. And now in terms of exit strategy, what we see is that insurance companies have a strong interest in um, micro insurance companies. So Allianz, for example, they invested $100 million in BIMA, 
for which I worked for four years. So I know this case very well. Uh, AXA invested the same way in micro insure. So once the company has enough traction, enough users, uh, these insurance companies, they are interested in acquiring this uh, know-how and uh, be able to re reach these customers with more products as they, uh, they become part of the middle class. So that's a potential exit strategy. Another exit strategy could be to sell to a mobile operator such as Orange or MTN. Uh, but more likely what we see in the market is uh, insurance company or reinsurance companies that invest in this field. So, so who would you say are your top um, potential acquirers for the African market? Is it Allianz? Is say, it... Yeah, I would say Allianz could be one of them, uh, but also Munich Re or Swiss Re. They already make some investments in that space, uh, like um, Swiss Re invested in Vandersat to acquire satellite data to measure the health of fields remotely. Uh, so yeah, these companies could be, uh, could be potential buyers. Uh, AXA also created AXA Climate, and they have the capability to build the products, but they don't have the distribution part. So if we manage to crack this distrib distribution uh, element, they could be also an interested uh, buyer in the long run. Okay. It, it seems like um, we, uh, we've already asked a lot of the questions from the audience here, thanks to Jim and Vishal. Um, I had one other question that's come up a couple times that might be interesting for you to answer, Simon, while well, Jim and, and Vishal get ready to have me ask them about their interest in this deal. Um, Simon, a couple of folks asked about your retention rate with the farmers. Did you want to talk about that? You've talked a lot about the acquisition. How's the retention rate? Indeed, that's a very good question because indeed we need to, uh, to get customers to stay on board so that we um, make good use of this uh, initial acquisition cost. So today we have only very little data to measure this, but some farmers that were with us last year um, with a corn product as well, I re-registered this year. And uh, for now on this small sample of about 50 farmers, we have a 60% retention rate. And but we think this will increase first because now we also offer access to loans. So farmers who don't, don't see the, uh, the benefit of insurance on a specific year, they will still know that it's worth being insured to have access to loans. Second, this, uh, this figure comes from a group of farmers where no claims were as payable. So they could have been discouraged um, and forgot about insurance, but they still re-registered. So once we are able to make some, to, to, to broadcast some information about the claims we paid, we will be more credible and more people will know that this is uh, the right cho choice to, to make. So we aim at I'm sorry, I don't want to dominate the, the conversation, but um, Aniko Zigovari from Atlantic Ventures had a really good question, which is really uh, who you're in discussions with. So ABM, uh, AB InBev, but wh what are some of the other corporates that uh, you're in discussions with today? Um, I think I have, yeah, I have a slide here. So um, we talked with Philip Morris, for example, to ensure tobacco, tobacco fields. We talked with Bai Kaibo for cocoa producers. And, uh, but actually the most recent discussion I've had are with the agricultural insurance of Benin. They uh, want to work with us. We're just uh, finishing the details there. Uh, we have also been approached by the regulator of Morocco and by Hollard in South Africa for some markets like uh, Swaziland and uh, Lesotho. So we see a lot of people coming to us now that we have this initial traction in Mali uh, because they've been looking for solutions to scale up uh, index insurance. So these are some names of uh, partners that uh, we're talking to. Gotcha. Thank you for that. Jim, I, I had a question, Jim, if, 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 if you don't mind. Could I just ask a question? Jordan? Go ahead, Go ahead Raj. Thanks. Time for hey, one, Simon, one last one. Simon, great presentation. Actually, I have, I have two questions. I'm going to be slightly cheeky. So what, the first was the question that you didn't quite answer from Jim, which was what's your own personal sort of view of exits and, and, and where do you want to see this business? But the second question is, do you see this business as a data business or an insurance business? And where do you see, do you see this growing into something else? Or do you see this just as a micro insurance business? Uh, where do you see this, this business going in the future? So as I said, we all have a strong commitment to making something that, that do, do, does good, not only is a good business, but it has a positive impact. We saw what happened to the Climate Corporation uh, that was acquired by Syngenta and turned into uh, a tool to sell more fertilizers and uh, weed killers. 
Um, so they turned indeed something that was made for insurance into a data business uh, and precision agriculture. Um, so we know there is a potential opportunity there, but that's not what we aim at doing at the moment. What we want is really financially empower farmers. We want to um, have a positive impact on, on, on their lives. And we think that's a very good business as well. Uh, there's a need for insurance and uh, that's something that generates money everywhere in the world. So we see this more as an insurance uh, business. We can possibly uh, uh, use the data that we generate internally to, for example, credit risk and provide micro loans um, at a better rate. So there is some use to do with the data. We can also help farmers know what kind of seed is more um, adapted to their location because we have this historical weather data. We know how, how they've been doing for the past few years. So there are additional services we can bring, but we want to build this around insurance and not drop this to create uh, just a tool for corporates to sell uh, more and more products. Um, so I hope this answers your questions. Thank you, Simon. Uh, we have it for still keeping in mind the purpose that we have. Thank you, Simon. Fantastic. Um, well, I want to bring us back to hearing uh, from our angels now. Um, thank you for that very informative presentation. I know before Arno drop, dropped off, he, he did mention in chat that he's very interested and would like to follow up with you, um, Simon. And now I'd like to turn to, to Michelle and ask, what's your interest? Hey, Arno, um, I love the presentation. I recognize that map because I want you to know I used to be the account partner for Orange Across Africa. Everything they bought on the Anglo side of that map, I bought for them. And, and okay. the guy that controls the purse strings today is my client. So the CEO of Orange Ventures is my old client, okay? Now, I'm very interested in your company. I could get you into other markets. I will probably bring other angels for the ride, but I want the same valuation as tech, tech stars. So I'll bring you between 50 and $100,000. We might do more. I'll bring a couple more of my buddies along. But I want between 50, but I want the tech star valuation, and I would like you to use my safe note. We can talk about that offline. And I can okay. jump in. I want Vishal's valuation, and I want to use his safe note. And <laughs> I'm very interested in uh, getting Who's involved. safe note? Vishal's safe note? Or it's Vishal, you know, Vishal's knew, safe note. I knew the lawyer on the call was going to take offense. So it is actually Raj Kula Singham's authored safe note. Well, congratulations, right. Simon. This is great. Jim, do you have that more to add? Uh, just that I think uh, what we should do is uh, do a, a separate call uh, with with Arno because I think uh, they're, they're, he did express some interest in that. So let's let's have a separate call with him, Vishal and and Raj. If I can recruit you, yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, since you're going to rewrite the safe note to be in our favor, of course. Look at and look. Actually, uh, look, no, so but so sorry, just to be clear. Say, sorry, sorry, no, sorry. Just, look, to be, just to be clear. We're not rewriting the safe note. The safe note is a safe note. We will use yeah. the Y Combinator safe note. Yeah. What we have is a, is a separate document called, called an easy, but we'll talk about that separately. So, so we're not trying to be clever. Yeah. We're just trying and to add some additional. Look, look Simon, look, and, and, and look, what's really important, and Jim's on the call as well, you know, we're very founder focused, okay? We're founder friendly and we'll work for you, right? But what we're not going to pay is valuations that doesn't make sense, right? So, um, we can help you with the relationship you have with Orange because we have it already, but we could get you into new markets in Nigeria, in Kenya, in Zambia, in Zimbabwe. So we can help with these markets by, by creating a syndicate and we can help grow the business. So that, that goes back to my first question, right? So if you're Mali focused, you're not for us, but if you're Africa focused, we want to do business with you. We'd love to do business with you and we could really work with you and expand you quickly, but we want tech star valuation, buddy. <laughs> Fantastic! I gotta say, congrats again, Simon. This has been a been a been a really good good round, and I'm so happy to to see how much interest you've gotten here. So, congratulations, Simon. Um, I want to take a moment just to share the the results from the poll here. You guys will see up. Not only do we have interest from our angels, but also from some folks here in the audience um, who would also be interested in investing with you, Simon. Um, 
And I wonder if now would be a good time also to share the results of the poll about where everyone was from. If we still have those um, from earlier on, maybe we'd like to see um, about our audience and where our audience is from as well. Um, oh, great. We have over half of our uh, guests today here joining us from Africa. We've got good representation from North America and Europe, as well as a, a handful of folks joining us from Asia and South America. So a typical global nest. Welcome on everyone. Glad to have so many folks with us. Okay, I'm going to now turn us to our next company. Um, we have Alex Kamanga here from Fundus, a B2, B, B2C marketplace from Kenya, connecting repair professionals and clients. And I'm excited to hear from Alex. Take us away. So hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Alex Kamanga. I am one of the co-founders and the team leader at Fundis. Now, if you have lived in any of Africa's urban regions, such as Nairobi, then perhaps you already know that we need the services of repairmen and women from time to time. But the biggest challenge is that a majority of them operate from the larger informal sector that is largely known for poor quality, that is known for low productivity, and in most cases is associated with um, poor services of qualities. So where and how do you find a repair person when you really need one? The answer is the Fundi's mobile application. Homes and workplaces can be able to find competent, vetted, and reliable repair pros, and while at it, get up to three months warranty on every single job that they get done. Customers using the Fundi's app get their jobs done in a way that is better, faster, and more affordable. While on the other hand, repair pros on this platform cut the amount of time they spend looking for work, and at the same time, have access to decent, regular income opportunities. Fundis is currently focusing on repairs, but the bigger goal is to focus on Kenya's offline segments, such as construction, retail, and home services that are at an estimated worth of $14 billion as of today. As at the close of the year 2019, online handmade platforms like Fundis had transacted $3 million US dollars. 1.4% of those jobs were done on the Fundis mobile application. We have one key competitor that has a five years head start to us, but we have made an entrance into this space by providing a very easy to use accessible mobile application. And to it, we have made unbeatable quality services affordable to every person. We are a team that is led by Kenyans. We have had the opportunity to work in different segments of the informal sector all across the country. We therefore think with an app, we will make our services available throughout the country and Africa at large. Our vetting, recruitment, and workers training has been cited as one of the best. My co-founder Sylvia and I have started and failed in two other startups within this same space. When we started Fundis in 2018, we took our first one year joining one of Nairobi's and Kenya's best accelerator programs where we met our third co-founder Jeffrey, who is one of the lead developers that the continent has. We also met our first investor, Korea Capital, and our current advisor, Michael, who happens to have been one of the senior leaders at IKEA for nearly a decade. This year, 2020, we are focusing on being able to get 1,500 jobs done. In the next five years, we hope to have 20,000 users across five cities. Our business model retains at least 10% of every job that gets done on the, uh, on the platform. In the last three months, we have also been testing another 5 to 10% commission on every part that is sold in the platform. This is because we have realized 50% of the jobs that get done on this platform have an element of a part being needed. As we are speaking today, we have fully completed, closed, and have 576 jobs paid for. That has translated to a little over 40,000 US dollars, and we have retained a 15% gross profit. Today at the next, we are inviting you for our new current round that is 300K USD for 30% equity in the company as a post-money safe note. 
We are valuing, uh, we are putting at a valuation cap of $1 million, and we are happy to discuss a 10 to 15% discount. The funds will go to user acquisition, upgrading our softwares, and operating a three-sided marketplace where we give more value to users, to workers, and to merchants on the platform. Thank you so much for your time, and I'm happy to take any questions that you may have for me. Great, Alex. Thank you for an excellent presentation. Over to our angels. And remember, audience, feed us some questions in the chat. We love getting to those, too. Michelle or Jim, thoughts? Alex, uh, thank you for that presentation. I, I, thought it was, I thought it was crisp and, and, and solid. The, you talked about your tech guy. Tell us a little more about your tech guy. Correct. Um, he, he, so, built the, uh, he built the, the, the guts of this, right? So tell us a little about him. I'm interested in your team. So talk to me about your team, starting with your tech guy. Yes. Um, Jeffrey is a very experienced technical and business leader. Um, he has been an advisor, a, a mentor at um, Andela, and currently is um, one of the Google Africa Scholarship Developer Mentors. Um, he has built um, and been on great teams before, such as um, ISRO, that is um, a, a mobile money uh, and POS system for small-scale retailers. Um, he has also been on um, the, the tech team for uh, Bandarini Studios and a few other um, products that are out there. Um, myself, I have you been... You must be paying him a lot of money or giving him a lot of equity to come to work for you, right? And I mean this affectionately, right? How does that work? Um, so the way we are working on this right now is that uh, we are looking at exactly what we think we will be able to build uh, in the next five years. First and foremost, we have very few service marketplaces that have been built on the continent right now. So bringing Jeffrey and myself and uh, Sylvia is simply because individually, we have tried to tackle this same problem of the informal sector from very different angles. So by bringing him and, 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 and my other co-founder is that we are looking eventually at what will the market and what will the gig economy look like in the next um, you know, five years to, to 10 years. Alex, I don't mean to cut you off, but is, is Jeffrey committed to you? Is he a full-time employee or committed to becoming a full-time employee to you? Yes, he is. Um, we have been together now for a little over half, um, one and a half years. So, I mean, we, so we now met that that, some, now that I, I just want to speed on because we have very little time, right? So now that you have some revenue and you've got technology, what I don't see in your team is someone to sell. So are you going to use some of this money to do some BD or sales? I don't, I don't see anyone with any kind of finance background either. Are you going to have someone count the cash? How's that working? So the current um, plan that we have right now is that, first of all, we opened um, our current round uh, um, about two months ago. And what we have been doing is that, first of all, we are working with um, open capital advisors um, for the purposes of, first of all, getting our finances right and getting um, our financial story and projections right. So what we are doing on that is that within this current round that we are doing, we have done a proper plan to um, have the financial docket well taken care of. And as even we are doing this round, that's one of the things that um, we are concentrating on and where the funds will go to. So that, that is the plan that is in place uh, currently. Thank you, Alex. And thank you, Vishal, for those questions. Jim, do you have any questions for Alex? Well, yeah, I, I, I want to hear more about your competition. Um, I know there's, there's quite a few people trying to do gig work uh, throughout East Africa. You know, what, what makes you guys different or better than some of the other things out there? Um, thank you, Jim. Um, so first of all, this happens to be, uh, for me, the second company that I'm trying to build um, together with my team in this space. And in 2016, the first company that we tried to build was within the construction space. And the whole angling that we had gone into that space with was we wanted to build 
um, a kind of a labor subcontracting platform. So what happens is that um, between ourselves as founders and the, and, and the lead team, we have tried to build the same solution from different angles, but to tackle the exact same problem. So what we did with Fundis is that we ideally just brought the best of the best in terms of approaches and in, best, uh, in terms of solution. But the other hand to it is that we have a really good understanding about why this particular sector has not been working very well for a very long time. Um, what are- So, so, so why, why hasn't been working so well for such a long time? And what exactly are you fixing? Because I, I understand the technology angle and I think that's smart, but you know, there are you know, companies like Lynx and others, they, they have faced issues trying to execute this model. So how are you going to get around those specific issues? Um, first of all, we think the biggest challenge that the market has had, obviously number one is um, the quality of skills that are in the market. But secondly to it is, how do you go about identifying you know, the best of the best or even intentionally putting a system in place that um, transfers some of the best skills? So that's actually what we have been very focused on and it's what our actually our background um, and the prior experiences that we have had are in. And we think we actually are one of the best platforms in terms of um, worker skills and recruitment and vetting. Our procedure has been cited as one of the best. So we obviously think that we are onto something in that when we compare to other platforms and we look at the quality of workers and the service delivery that they have in the market, we have a little bit of a, um, an edge to anyone else that is in this space. And that also means we have, a long, uh, we have a really good shot at building the first successful service marketplace, not just in Kenya or East Africa, but across the continent. Hey, um, Alex, if you could just come back again. Um, would you just speak to us a little bit about your background? Tell us a little bit about your background. And... All right. So um, my background is in, um, in legal studies, but um, the bulk of my experience has been in sales, marketing, and a bit of management. Um, so I was the country um, sales director for one of the leading um, uh, POS providers for um, small scale and um, you know, small, small micro resellers. Um, I was also the head of retail for um, one, one of the largest um, companies that was in the space for also providing solutions to small uh, micro, um, micro sellers that's now known as Panda Africa, but before was operating as in Kisha. Yeah, other than that, um, I've had a really good experience um, working with um, a few mid-sized law firms in, um, in the commercial segments and basically just interacting with the SME sector. So that's, that's personally my background. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Um, I heard you talking a little bit about, um, before Vishal's last question, about the, the quality of, of skills in the market and that being a differentiator for you. And there were a couple related questions from the audience around, you know, how do you, um, assure the standards and, and how do you evaluate, you know, the, the, the skills of your, of your laborers and, and, and then a, and a related question, if people really do like, like the service and the service provider, how do you ensure that they continue to work through you rather than going directly back to the um, provider for the second service? To echo that, I understand that just some mediation uh, or going around you guys or going around a platform is, is a common issue with some of your competitors. All right, um, let me begin with the second question and that's in relation to leakage um, in the platform. So first and foremost, we have been able to figure out why, you know, when you procure um, a repair persons or uh, an informal sector worker by yourselves, why they are likely in most cases to overcharge you or to be pricey, it's simply because they are really never able to tell when am I going to get the next job. So first and foremost, what we have done is that in return to providing these pros with regular jobs, um, we have created um, an aspect where, first of all, the price that you get if you're engaging them by themselves, on, the, uh, on this platform, it's actually a little bit lower. And this is because 
they are not trying to capitalize on this one job because they don't know when the next job will, uh, the next job will show up. But on the other side to it is that on every single job that you get done on this platform, um, you get up to three, mar uh, three months warranty on that job. And that means that, you know, should you have an issue, maybe you want um, the same problem has recurred again, or you, went up, you want a follow up to it, you know you have access to the platform and you can always get that as opposed to getting, you know, a random person out there and the next time you need them, um, you don't know where you're going to get them. So those would be the two aspects, first of all, that would prevent leakage from happening. The other side to it is that from the worker's perspective, um, why would you want to risk losing, you know, a few more other jobs within the month at the expense maybe of this one, one job that is at hand right now? On the other hand, on the other question of, um, so how do we go about, you know, work identification and, and the vetting? Um, so we have actually, I think, one of the best and one of the most robust processes for, for gig workers um, on boarding. So ours is a three-phase um, plan that happens. So first of all, we believe that our customers out there and our users out there have, in one way or the other, in the past, experienced really good um, informal sector workers or repair persons. So we want them to recommend something that, uh, someone that they have come across that they really liked. And secondly, once we have those contacts or those details, or even you know, a really great work out there reaches out to us, the next phase that we move into is, can we be able to get a feel of what you've been able to do before? That means, can you be able to send across works that you have done? Or can we be able to speak to someone you have worked under or worked for? That could be a customer, that could be maybe a construction company. And once we have those, we move to looking at what's the quality of that work. Then again, once we are satisfied with that, we move you to another stage where we actually want to know what are your community ties? Where do you work from? Where else have you been before? And those kinds of things. So by the time you're coming on the platform, we have a really good resume about what you have accomplished and where your skills level are at. And once you, we, you come on the platform, the next six months, we'll simply be looking at the feedback that the customers and users are providing about you. And once we are really satisfied about that, you are fully a fundis fixer. It's one of the most robust processes and one that um, has enabled us to really deliver good quality of work. Great. Well, thank you, Alex. I'm going to move in a moment to um, turning this back to the angels. Did you guys have any one last questions? And, and I knew maybe one of your investors, Mark Curia, might be with us. And if he was here, if he wanted to offer any questions as well, certainly invited. Uh, hey, I don't think I'm going to answer any questions uh, or ask any questions. Uh, I'll just leave it at well, that. I, I would love to hear. I mean, uh, Mark, what don't we know? Tell us what we don't know. Uh -huh. I, I mean, I think I, Alex is, is handled it so well. I, I feel like he's a, a public speaker, now, maybe a second career in politics. I don't know. It's very, very good. Um, no, I think it's, it's, it's a robust model, which has got a really good selection logic. I, I'll maybe put in a quick word about Sylvia. Uh, so Sylvia, the CEO, COO, is really, really talented as well. And she's a big part of that selection logic that picks, picks the fixes. Uh, I think she has this background in, in psychology which has actually been a you know, big winning factor in getting the right fixes and understanding their profile and keeping them happy. Awesome. Thank you for that insight, Mark. Appreciate it. Okay, well, I'm going to bring it back now um, to Vishal and Jim. Um, tell us, what is your interest in this ass? Look, I, I like where you've got to with the technology bill piece. Um, I worry that you're a little earlier than my blood would normally allow me to invest. Uh, you raised $50,000 to date. I, I'm, I'm usually a little later seed investor. You just saw the conversation we had with, with Simon Company just before. So that's about the level that I'm usually in. And it's principally around team. So I worry that by participating at this stage, I'll have quite a bit of a heavy lifting to do. Um, there is a but, and the, and the but is um, Mushiro's dad. So the courier in Korea Capital is a ex-partner of mine and an old friend. And if Korea says to me, invest, I would change my mind. So that's the but. And, and uh, as long as Mushiro can say to me in an offline room that he's going to continue to 
to work with you and toil and do the heavy lifting, I'll reconsider. So on those bases, I'll reconsider, but otherwise you're a little early for me. Thank you, Vishal. I appreciate those comments. Mark? I was going to jump in and say, yeah, I'm so willing to give my, my evenings to working in the Fundies. <laughs> Well, but the, the issue, the, the issue, Mushiro, and for the sake of, uh, you know, other potential investors is, is as well. When Mushiro's evenings, when Mark's evenings dry up and he finds himself a new girlfriend and he finds himself a new hobby, then who's going to take this forward? And I think that for investors, you'll need to answer that question as you get to the next round, that what does your management team look like? Who's doing business development? Who's counting the money? What are you doing in terms of scalability and what kind of advisors and mentors are you surrounding yourself from a scalability standpoint? So I think that's the heavy lifting that I'm referring to and that worries me. Any questions and um, still lots of opportunities here. Jim, did you have any thoughts for Alex? Yeah, so I, I think there's still a number of un un unanswered questions from my side, especially around uh, system remediation and how you're going to keep people on the platform and how you also differentiate from some of these other competitors. And I also echo uh, some of what Vishal said. It, it is a bit early. Uh, love to see a, a more uh, fully formed team. So what I'd like to do is stay in touch, but uh, I don't think I'm ready at this stage to be involved. But certainly, let's be in touch. And, and maybe once you have a bit more traction and have proven that you can overcome some of those issues that uh, we had discussed with you know, real data, then it's something that uh, perhaps uh, we can look at. Thank you, Jim. And thank you very much again to Alex um, and to Mark for piping up for this really excellent presentation. Obviously you have a lot of traction and we'll certainly look forward to seeing you back here again when the time is right. Um, we just threw up a poll here to see who else was interested in investing. And we did see um, a lot of interest at, at uh, the $10,000 investment level from the crowd too. So maybe there's another ask in there even amongst this crowd to get you, get you guys to that next, next phase. Um, thank you, Fundus, for being here today. Um, thank you to all of uh, our entrepreneurs um, coming back again. Uh, to Simon Schwal from OCO. We appreciated your presentation. Um, thank you to Arno, who was here earlier, to Vishal for all of your important probing questions, to Jim. Um, and thank you everyone who, who joined us in the audience today, which is really what makes this a real show and a real um, a live event. I also want to appreciate Ayano from Untapped who helped vet these great companies. Um, Jim, thank you for putting this incredible Nest series together thank and inviting you, me for to host hosting. today. So it's it's just a treat, um, and and Great appreciate job. everyone contributing all your comments and questions to the chat feed. Um, if you were an entrepreneur and you didn't get a chance to read all those, definitely go back. Um, this this episode will be a recording of this episode will be available on findthenest.org, and they also put the chat feed on there, so you can go back and read through any helpful suggestions you may have missed from the crowd. Um, I look forward to seeing all of you again here, again in coming weeks, or maybe even at an opportunity collaboration down the road when it's in person uh, is, is, is safe again. And until then, everyone take care. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Thank you so much.